Why don't you take the... Uh, take. Thank you all. Fit. Norton well, Jester, Jules Pfeiffer, fit. wherever you, Jules, take the central throne, if you would. <laughs> I can't figure out how to get there. <laughs> um, I, first of all, can I say something? Yes, please. I'd like to thank, thank very much the guy who played the part of Norton Jester. I <laughs> <laughs> he, he was very good, wasn't he? Yeah. And he had kind of, and he gave it a glamour that, <laughs> could, could I just say I wanted to, that's a charming and, and soulful documentary. So can I thank uh, Hannah and Janice? Where are you here? <laughs> up, up, up. So um, you guys working can on I anything? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 from the time I heard that there was, Hannah was playing a documentary on this book, I thought it was absolutely nuts. <laughs> And I couldn't believe that, how are you going to fill an hour with this? And it's a lovely piece of work. And, uh, you know, and uh, apart from anything Norton and I have to do with this, it's just a lovely piece of work. Exactly so. Exactly so. And, um, <laughs> and I'm very grateful it was made. And, it's, and it's, it does what a lot of films, a lot of documentaries, it was coherent. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly so. It had a beginning, uh, middle, and an end. Yes. And if only you had reminded me to brush my hair, it would have been, <laughs> it would have been a masterpiece of and, and, documentarian's art. Um, and, and anything that features Norton and me and is still coherent to find the arts. <laughs> well, there's one thing that was just mentioned briefly in there, that, and it struck me, because that's what both Jules and I, I think we're, we're trying to do, is that the story moved along, and it, it was full of a million revisions and changes and, uh, and ideas. And a lot of what ended up in that book, we had not anticipated, and in many cases, didn't even know was in there. And from the mail, we, we get a lot of mail on it, and, and things that people say on it, I'm, certain, I'm quite often startled, because they're not something, I didn't write that, I didn't put that in. And it's there because they're thinking in their own way about this now. Uh, book is searched that way. What, what, a question I had for you, um, Norton, and you, you started telling me, um, is why Milo? Milo is an unusual name for an American <coughs> boy. Well, he, it turned out he, the name didn't come from an American, from an American boy. I, I was in England in the early to mid-50s. That I had a Fulbright, and I was on, going to school at the University of Liverpool, a pre-Beatle Liverpool. <laughs> that, that must have been a very discouraging well, place. It, well, <laughs> of course. The first, the first date I ever had there was in a place called Penny Lane. What did I know about Penny Lane? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> but uh, I, I uh, traveled around and did all kinds of things. And there were a lot of things, you know, always kind of percolating in my, in my mind. And when I finally sat down and said, okay, I'm going to write this. And basically, I know I'm going to be my, the model for what the boy is. But... I had almost never gotten really to the root of some of the things I was thinking about. And the book was the process. Mm -hmm. And I learned a tremendous amount. And, and the, the letters all began to reflect that. You know, this has changed my life, or I think about things differently now. And I said to myself, that couldn't be better. That's what the book should do for any book, you know, make you think. Uh, and, and the kids in school, the, the, uh, the meaning of it is what it means to you. It's not what a teacher will tell you, this book means this, or right. this story you know, means that. And uh, you try that in school sometimes, and you get batted down completely. Yeah. Yeah. The book is about something. Well, it is, and maybe that's a guide. But you can't you know, go by that, because you see some, sometimes things become so clear for an individual. It's like an epiphany. You, you, you see something, and you see the world, in a way that you never have looked at it before. And, and if a book does that to you, 
Man, that's a good thing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, practical question. Um, what keyed off the book becoming a success? One of the things I know that happened is, is that The New Yorker, which is sponsoring this evening, um, Emmy Maxwell uh, gave it a very good review. Right. Was that the turn? Was that the thing that kind of got people uh, started it's, on it? It was. That I think was the first big review that, uh -huh. that got it started. I picked it up and I read it and I said, "Oh my God, I couldn't have written that review. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have had the nerve." But I just just realized something. My mind tends to wander sometimes. I didn't answer your question about my life. Let me go back for a second. Some of you might have noticed. I was I was that. going to circle. <laughs> I was going to circle yeah. back to it gently. Norman. Right. <laughs> I was at Liverpool, and I had a lot of friends who were in the theater in Dublin. And there was a great traffic back and forth between Liverpool and Dublin. Probably the most miserable water trip in the whole world. <laughs> the Irish Sea is always very rough. And we never had enough money to buy a ticket inside. So we spent the entire trip overnight on the deck, mm -hmm. you know, trying to hold on to whatever we, we ate for dinner. <laughs> and we would go over there, and I got to know a lot of the people. And there was one young man who was a wonderful actor and finally came to this country and had a very good career here, my, called Milo O'Shea. I don't know whether any of you know that name. He played character parts, mostly. Uh, I didn't know him terribly well, but I, I liked him along with the other people. And that name just stuck. I just loved the name, because it was not a name I knew. And I wanted something that was, would take him out of the realm of just being an ordinary kid. It was, he a was Bob or a, Yeah, he was himself. Yeah. It was yeah. new. He was new. I remember being struck with it too. And, we, and it's funny, there are two Milos in all of American yes. literature. Milo from the Phantom Tollbooth and Milo Minderbender in Catch-22, um, which were both published, I think, in the same yeah. year, right? In, in yeah, right. It was in the same, same year. Same so But I think I was mentioning before that uh, there's been, Milo has become a very popular name, I'm told. And people, you know, I, and when I go to book signings, there's always a couple of Milos I have to pat on the head or shake that. <laughs> and I was at one book, a uh, signing out in California, and I, there were three Milos I met. And then some woman who must have been about eight and a half months pregnant came up, and I had to pat Milo. <laughs> <laughs> Through the le, truly right. the laying on of hands, right? Right. Through the thing, Jules. I've as you, you know, I've done written a couple of children's books, and one of them I did in with the uh, uh, wonderful artist Bruce McCall, who had also never done a children's yeah. book like like you, uh, another grumpy satirist who had been lassoed into uh, wonderful into New York a cover artist and and like, terrific yeah. uh, and terrific artist. And the one thing that Bruce could not do was draw a ten-year-old girl. And since the protagonist of the story was a 10-year-old girl, this created some, some <laughs> difficulties. And finally, his, his wife and daughter staged an intervention where they forced him to look at various images of 10-year-old girls so he could do it. Was there anything in Norton's text that was just for you as an artist, uh, that kind of challenge where you said when you read it, how am I going to draw that? Everything. <laughs> oh. I, you know, as, as was stated in, in the film, I didn't see myself as a children's book illustrator. Also, I was, well, it, you, what happened, there's a backstory here. Back in the 50s, when I was eager to do mostly a syndicated comic strip just out of the army, and I was putting up together things, but I couldn't interest anybody in anything, so I thought I'd some, uh, make some samples up of children's book stuff and take it around, and I took it around to a publisher, uh, Ursula Nordstrom at Harper's, and... Um, and I thought it was just pretty good stuff. And she says, this reminds me of a young man who's inside. I'd like to introduce you to Marie Sendak. Huh. And I took a look at it's the book he had just done with Ruth Krauss, A Hole is to Dig. And I said, I think I'll become a political cartoonist. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I, as, you know, I knew and loved Marie's and Norton, too, who loved, yeah. and loved him. And, and, um, and he had created such... You know, he was the 800 to 8,000 pound gorilla in, you know, in, in his business. And I t did not have children at the time. I didn't feel any kind of connection uh, to the children's world as I subsequently did with, you know, with yeah. beginning with my daughter Kate who's here and my, and my daughters Hallie and Julie. But at that time, I was an independent operator trying to get laid. What do I care about children? <laughs> you know, and, 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 um, but what I did love was children's illustration, English children's illustration. And Norton, you know, with the name Milo and Norton always hanging around uh, a secondhand bookstore in Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights, full of English books and right. English literature. I just started going through those books, and there was a man named Edward Arderzone who did children's right. illustration. And I, I, 
his line drawings connected to what the sort of thing that I thought I might learn how to do. So basically, I was just trying to legitimize myself as the, um, as the interpreter of Norton's work, which seemed, you know, could have been almost English, the use of wordplay, for example, mm -hmm. and, um, and a kind of formal line structure, which was very foreign to my own style. But as much as anything else I realized in later years, it's, uh, I'm a cartoonist. Mm -hmm. And what cartoonists know how to do just because it's their birthright, is they know how to capture expression and they know how to capture a scene and, and they know how to tell a story in pictures. So it, what I was able to do just instinctively, whatever style I chose, was to pick out the emotion of the moment and the emotion of the story and carry that through. And that's what cartoonists do. And one of the most powerful uh, images actually in the whole book, and I think it's something that scared me throughout my childhood, is the one uh, inexpressive figure you drew, the, the terrible trivium, oh, and yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the faceless man in the, yeah. in the hat, which has got to be the scariest thing. And there was in Dick Tracy back in the 19, late 1930s a character named Red Rum, which is murder spelled backwards, who had no face. And I was simply swiping Chester Gould. <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> but we, we, had a, we had a little bit of a war over the illustrations for it because Jules, as been, he stated many times himself, doesn't like to draw backgrounds. And backgrounds means anything but a human figure. <laughs> and uh, so a lot of different things happened. Like one thing I was, I was sure was going to happen, I was going to make it happen, I was going to have a map in the book. Because I grew up with a lot of books with maps, the Arthur Ransom books, all of them open up and there in the end papers was a map. And Jules wouldn't draw a map. <laughs> I don't even think to till today he recognizes maps or what they do. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I can't find my way. Once I open the door, I don't know where I am. I have no sense of direction. Uh, yeah. Even my GPS gets lost. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the thing was that uh, I had to draw the map. And being, you know, being an architect and everything, I drew pretty well. I, I drew the map. I gave it to Jules, he put a piece of tracing paper over it and redrew it so it, would, it made sense, so it would have his line consistent with the others. And all through the years, a lot of people have come up to us and said how much they enjoy the map. And Jules always had the grace to accept all that praise <laughs> himself. <laughs> but anyway, there, there were other things that came up. There was the one scene near the end of the book where there's the army of wisdom is going to go along trying to uh, rescue Rhyme, Reason, and Milo, who are just returning with them. And they're mounted on horseback. Jules announced that he doesn't draw horses. <laughs> Would I mind if he put the army on cats? <laughs> I couldn't draw cats either. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, finally, grudgingly, he drew me a couple of little silhouettes of horses. And if you look carefully in the book, I think there are four horses and three riders or three Horses and four riders, I'm not quite sure. Three horses, yeah. right. But all throughout the book, it was almost as if it began to change subtly, so I would try to make up things that would give him maximum difficulty <laughs> to draw. And he would try to subvert everything. You know, I told him, the one near the end of the book, there, there's a group of demons called the Triple Demons of Compromise. One short and fat, one tall and thin, and the third exactly like the other two. <laughs> Try drawing that sometime. <laughs> but the, we it ultimately ended up, it was just a great deal of fun, you know, to do those things. Some, I remember reading someplace that neither of you guys was ever satisfied, breaks my heart, with um, rhyme and reason, either as characters or as, as images. But now that you married one. I did, I did. <laughs> Willowy girl with long hair and a kind expression. So right? w what did I know? <laughs> In the, um, but if, when you say that, though, Joel, you know, thinking about the great British tradition, one of the things that strikes me is, is that I think The Phantom Tollbooth very much is our American Alice book. And John Tenniel, the, uh, Carol's great illustrator, was like you, a political cartoonist, not somebody who had ever drawn children's books. And it's that same acerbic edge that I think gives his uh, mm -hmm. images the power of yours. Well, it's having an opinion about the work. You know, mm -hmm. so you, see, you see some wonderful illustrations in contemporary children's books, and, and, and uh, but the, but 
among the wonderful skills, uh, the illustrated often doesn't have an attitude. You know, to mm -hmm. know that you don't know, you can't look at the page and tell part of the story. And, and as a cartoonist, coming out of a comic strip background, which I always adored and still do, uh, it was about the combination of words and pictures and how integrated they are, and you can't deal, have one without the other. Mm -hmm. And right. it's what I always believed and always aimed to, and basically it was how I thought. I yeah. still think. And the thing that most people don't recognize is how much work those illustrations do. If, if they're done well, and sometimes it's annoys the hell out of me, you can eliminate great chunks of the words. Yes, in the, in the <laughs> Um, Norton, something, you know, talking about the extraordinary success of the book and the things that keyed it off, it's something that I've, I've always wanted to ask you, never had a chance to, and that is, it, was there something for you as a writer, you went on to write The Dot and the Line, which is a mm -hmm. wonderful, um, a very different kind of classic. Yeah, exactly. But... i like to know why we have all that much out there. there. No. <laughs> but... Writing, you know, and Amy Maxwell in her review for The New Yorker said this book is, and I don't think she used quite these words, an instant classic, and I felt that as a five-year-old kid reading it. Was that ever a difficulty for you as a writer, knowing, that, knowing you had written something that well, I think really it worked? In the yeah, it, it scares you a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny, I, I, not for the, the reason that it was successful, that caused me some problems in just getting started again on the next, second or third or fourth, uh, you know, books. But... Uh, it, you suddenly say to yourself, oh my goodness, am I, gonna, if I, this next book is going to be good, they're going to want me to do another one, mm -hmm. and then another one, and then the, that, that really bothered me. Mm -hmm. And so each, I decided the second book could have n literally nothing to do with the first one, and that's where the dot and the line came from. It's so different. You, you, it's a romance, yeah. right? And it's, a, it's about mathematics, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, I, I just didn't want anybody, and it's, to this day, I still get let us win as the next one is the sequel coming out yes. and everything. Did you ever contemplate doing, because this is, this is Alice in Wonderland, did yeah. you ever contemplate doing it through the looking glasses? I, I did, made a lot of notes on things and I just decided it was not the kind of a story that I wanted to carry on, you know, in, into another realm or another point of view. It works with some things, you know, I, I just didn't think it would work that way. I wanted it to stand alone and that, so far that is fine. So far, so good. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> um, well, you did Albert the Wise. Uh, um, you did some other things. Oh, yeah, I did a lot, but they weren't related to this. And no, no, but, the, but, the, but it was a formal uh, way of storytelling. Yeah. A book a little known today, um, unfortunately, Albert the Wise, extraordinarily illustrated by uh, Domenico Gnoli, which you know, is just a lovely piece of work. Yeah, altogether. it is gorgeous, yeah. yeah. And, and then, of course, there have been the adaptations. Of, mm -hmm. um, uh, opera, musical, and on all of that too, and an, and an animated film that had a complicated life, right? Yeah, well, which I didn't like very much. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> that's what I meant. But by I think no, life. you s scratch any hundred authors, and ninety nine of them are not going to like what's done. With what's been, what's been made of it since? Talk a little bit because it's something that comes up in the film, something that I, I know you guys feel um, strongly about, about the context in which this 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 book was written. That is. As you were saying in the film, Jules, it's the Cold War period. It's a time when there's a lot of suspicion of the value of learning of, uh, for its own sake, of, of just well, thinking about things. Also, both of us being young men at the time, Norton just recently out of the Navy, <clears throat> although it was hard to figure out when Norton exactly was in the Navy, <laughs> because he always acted as if he was out of the Navy even when he was in the Navy. <laughs> Uh, but but Norton out of the Navy, I out of the Army. During the it was uh, during the latter days of the Korean War, it was during uh, both the heyday of McCarthyism and and post McCarthyism, and the sense um, that we you know in this world which had very definite forms of acceptance and rejection and things you were allowed to do and things you weren't allowed to do. And the very things it seemed to me belatedly years later I, I thought about was that the world that Milo goes into is this confusion of what they're saying as against his, his own perceptions and his own confusion. And he's always assuming that they must have a point, that they must be right in some way. That, you know, and so he's, he, he's not political. He doesn't, he doesn't know anything. And he's just trying to figure it out. And he's figuring it out through a child's logic. And in the world we lived in then, as, as well as the world we live in now, 
that logic fails completely. I mean, all you have to do is, is uh, tune on your TV and see what goes on in, this, in, the, in the Republican Congress, and you know that, that it, it could be right out of the, the Phantom Toll booth. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I, the, the other thing which I remember as a kid being very puzzled by um, the fact that I learned very, very early that I just didn't understand the way adults thought about things. They puzzled me. And I know that they had the same problem with me because my parents never knew what they would get from me if, some, if we got into a discussion or something. In fact, some of them got to the point where they were very, uh, they got very edgy. And, I, and my mother's line to end the conversation was always, well, how can you be right and the rest of the world wrong? <laughs> and it was a long time before I realized that was very possible. <laughs> And, and, but they, they have very different roles. You've talked about this. I've always thought about it. When you're a kid, you want to venture, you want to go out, you want to take chances, you want to do all the crazy things constantly to test yourself and, and, and have fun and find out things that, uh, and come back with things that other people you know, don't know about. And it's dangerous. All of those things have their own kind of danger. And that's the role of, of the child. But the role of the adult is exactly the reverse. Keep them safe. Be careful, don't let them venture. And no. you can, it's like, a, it's like a, 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 I can't keep this thing straight. Two things just heading into each other at full speed and boom, they blow up into, onto each other. I, I, I said once that the, it's the moment your children are born, you go from being a boat to being a harbor, right? <laughs> and then you're, and the, it's the child's order to be a boat to be the, to, to go out. But it's true, isn't it, that on this side, so to speak, of the Iron Curtain, the book had a kind of a, a gently subversive message mm -hmm. about the value of learning. But it's the case that on the other side of the Iron Curtain, it had, a, it had an effect as well. Yeah, it did. And I didn't know about that until years you know, afterwards. And, and tell about, tell about. Well, I, I, um, the, there was a woman who came to uh, University of Massachusetts, right up where we are in, right. in Amherst. Uh, she had a full right, and uh, she called me up, and she wanted to talk about children's books and that. She came over. And we got very friendly. And, uh, she, and we stayed friendly. I've seen her from time to time. We always, we're always in contact with each other. And she wrote one of the letters that's in the back of the uh, 50th anniversary edition of the Phantom Toll Book that talks about, as a child in the Soviet Union, her reading of the book and what it meant. And it, it staggered me because I had no idea that that had any of that effect on anyone there. Because living in a, in a bureaucratic, totalitarian yeah. society. Some of the things that were, I thought were pure fantasy in there were very real to her. And that, and that realizing that the society was absurd, yeah, right. you weren't yeah, right. a crazy one, was, was, was a very, very powerful thing for her. I want to open up um, to this audience. I'm sure you've got a million questions. So come out here. We've got uh, microphones on either side. and. Uh, and line up and talk. One of the things that we, when I did a piece in the, uh, in the New Yorker about this 50th anniversary and had a chance to meet these, these heroes, um, one of the th details that I thought was wonderful is the one thing that's missing from the book is a toll booth, right? There's no, you never drew a toll booth. I, don't, I didn't draw the toll booth and I didn't realize that until, <laughs> what, a week ago? Uh, uh, <laughs> it's, but, you know, a toll booth was a thing, and a car was a thing, and I couldn't draw a thing. I hated... Thing, the thing that's... I, I didn't know what things looked like, <laughs> and, 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 and I knew what people looked like, and I could draw people and monsters or whatever it is in any pose imaginable. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, but I, you know, if I had to draw a telephone, I had to have a telephone in front of me modeling. <laughs> and to this day, that's not any different. Yeah. It, can, I, can I bring up one, one thing that... Uh, it took me a long time to figure out what to do to get Milo from one world into the other. And, you know, and the t it says in the movie, they, they go into it a little bit, but it was very difficult. And for me, the, the, the toll booth was just a vehicle getting him from one world into the other. And when I talk at schools, uh, one of the questions that always comes up is, okay, who gets the toll booth next? And, uh, because at the end of the book, it yeah. disappears. Yeah, and, it and, says they, we and need you it don't know. Another. It implies that it's going on to do other things. And I realized that was, again, one of those things I had not really thought through in the book. Because uh, to me, when I thought about it later, it wasn't the toll booth itself that was really terribly important. It was just a way for me to get them from one place to the other. What was important and that you needed as a, as a, as a vehicle was something 
that would make something new clear to this person, either a child or adult. And as I used the word before, as an epiphany. I mean, I think in our lives, there are always points that come along where you see something searingly clear, or you see it in a way that you've never thought about it before, and it opens up all kinds of new possibilities or ways, ways to understand things. We all do it, we all have it, but sometimes we don't recognize those things, or we don't grab onto them, and they disappear, and they're gone from our lives. And I remember talking to kids about this in a way that I said, they're not going to understand the word of what I'm saying here, but I think I, I have to say it, that that's really, that's really the fight, that they have to see that something has changed and there are other possibilities in their life that they can grab onto. Can, can I also just, as a thing, it's a, I guess you have to be a writer to appreciate this, but technically there's a bravura thing in the book, which is he's just there. You know, magicians sometimes say about tricks, don't run if they're not chasing you, don't say there's nothing up my sleeve if nobody's asking. And one of the beautiful things, just as, as, as writing in The Phantom Tollbooth, is you just assert things, right? He's in one world and then he's in the other world. You don't waste time on all the little interstices that writers can get bogged down in in that book. Well, one of the things that uh, I, I get sometimes is just puzzled comment and sometimes people get angry about it that the parents are nowhere there. Yeah, the yeah. But that's part, that's exactly yeah, it. Exactly. Instead right. of having worry through the parents, they're just not there. Um, we'd love to have some... Let me add to that. Sure. You know, as Norton has said before, this was his first book. The reason he doesn't have those connections is he didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it, but it, is, it is the, uh, uh, the, the genius of the, uh, the untutored mind there. Could you... Hi. Hi. Introduce yourself and... Yeah. Ask a question. Okay. Um, can I make a comment, too? Uh, sure. We prefer questions to comments as a general rule. At the, okay. But. So my name's Tanya. Um, my quick comment is just a, a very deep thank you. And I, it, I feel like the book hasn't just changed my life. I feel like it influences every important decision I make no. <laughs> till this day. Here, here. Um, really. Um, and I guess my absurdly unanswerable question that I'd like you to try to answer anyway is if you have any thoughts on, um, I guess, the education system or what we could use from the book in schools at any level, you know, at any age. Um, what are we doing wrong? What's one little thing we can change that would be, you know, more of a phantom toll booth adventure than what it is now? Jules, Jules <laughs> told me every time I got stuck on a question, I should look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and because I'm deaf, I didn't hear the question. So, uh, <laughs> Do you know, I am going to take that question, if I might. Well, well, can you tell me what the question was before? The, the question was, is how could you apply the wisdom of the Phantom Tollbooth to the business of education? Yeah. And I will. Badly. An, ba <laughs> well, I will, with enormous vanity, in the presence of these two creators, say, I wrote a little essay about the book um, in the magazine. And the thing that always strikes me is the key to the story is that there's enormous expertise uh, in Digitopolis. There's enormous expertise in Dictionopolis. They know an awful lot, yeah, right. but they don't know anything because they've lost rhyme and reason. Mm -hmm. And rhyme, excuse me, rhyme and reason represent, what should we call it, the joy of learning, learning for its own sake, the pleasure, the meaning of expertise. And, 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 and relearning. I mean, one yeah. of the most influential terms I've ever read, it was uh, years ago in my mid-twenties, I read an autobiography of the great muckraking journal journalist Lincoln Steffens, and he's all through his book, he said, unlearn. Yeah. Unlearn yeah. what they teach you, because they are lying. They don't always <laughs> think they're lying, but they are, it's the official view, and question it, question it, question it, and then at a certain point, question your own views, and it doesn't mean that you are, you can't make your mind up, it's a way of, of making your mind up, and uh, so much of us, all of us growing up in the school system have gotten these official views and mm -hmm. as Norton has said, as I've said, when you, when you just say what you think without trying to challenge anything, you're treated like the outsider. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, if there's a thing that people are now forced to do, and actually it's teach to the test, and I would think that the moral of the Phantom Tollbooth, if it has one, is never teach to the test because the test isn't worth yes, taking. That's right, exactly. It's, a, I think, a very scary thing to open up, we're talking about opening up the world and, <clears throat> and the world of teaching especially. Uh, 
where you're allowing a lot of things to happen that you don't have very strong control over. And it's, it's, it's the great blessing, I think. It's, it's, how, it's how you really learn. But it's also the danger of people think about losing control of the system. I don't know a simple way to do that because there are always going to be people lined up on both sides of that. So, um, This gentleman here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Thank Zach. Um, my question for Norton is, uh, to what extent your background as an architect influenced the book um, and sort of in converting these areas of thought into spaces? Um, and during the writing, did you play around with these spaces and where they were? And did that, you know, did they change? And Well, I, yeah, I, I don't think... Certainly, I wouldn't be the same kind of writer. I even doubt sometimes that I'd been a writer at all if I hadn't trained and practiced as, as an architect. It's a, it's a much different way of, of thinking about things. Uh, when you're working in architecture or designing or trying to put together a piece of the world, uh, you have to do it from many different viewpoints. You have to examine things from the, well, if I did this, well, if I take the opposite viewpoint and do that. And those things get rattled around inside your head for long enough and they begin to coalesce into things that do make sense and do what you want to do. And it's a, it's a most valuable way of thinking. I think that, to me anyway, the best liberal arts education I could have gotten, I got through an architectural program that, that had within it almost no liberal arts courses. And, uh, and that worked, you know, very, very much for me. Uh, it did, it, in terms of visualizing, yes, I think it's also very useful. I find it very hard to write about, a, a, say, a character when I can't see him, not just a very quick take on what they, they look like, how they move, the gestures, the way things are said. There are an awful lot of ways you see people, and in the same way that you see environment, you know, you get very much influenced. Dickens was the great master at this kind of thing. He could set up a situation so that he has said half of what he needs to say before he said anything, just by his descriptions or a choice of a name or something like that. So I, yeah, I think I, to me that was a very crucial thing in my life, and that, and it wasn't planned, and I didn't know that was happening. You know when it when it was happening. So thank you. Um, let me come over here. My name is Don. Uh, question. Uh, will you talk a little bit about your collaboration on your 50th anniversary publication? The collaboration on the 50th anniversary publication. Did you guys get together? Had you, are you guys in constant touch, or are you, was that a kind of occasion? We try for... not to, no. We <laughs> well, Norton lives up in Massachusetts, and I live out in Long Island, and uh, we talk on the phone, uh, you know, uh, infrequently, but, but, but enough to keep in contact with each other. And, um, and then we collaborated on a book yeah. that called The Odious Ogre just a few years ago. Uh, and, and, um, but we, you know, it's interesting with friendship that goes over this long, you know, that we may not talk for months at a time yeah. when we know exactly right. what's going on. Exactly. Right. That's a, that is a nice thing. Thank you. The lady here. Hi. Um, I was wondering um, if 50 years later, is there anything that either of you would have changed about what you did mm. or added to what you created? Wow, yes. Well, it's funny, occasionally I'll pick up the book and go through it. And I always see things that make me wince. Mm. Ah! And uh, <laughs> I say to myself, well, I should really change that out for the next editions. And then I go back, well, that's the way it is. That is its life now, and you can't really do that. Or if you start doing it, there's no end. It's like I, I'm one of the world's great revisers. Uh, and for very strange reasons. I'm, uh, again, because of my interest in words and rhythms in the book, that I'm always revising things to points that are, can be ridiculous. Uh, I might want to change a word from two syllables to three, or for, re reverse in, from three to two, or put a comma somewhere, because I want the, the story to be read in a way, and I can remember this as a kid, being able to go buy something I didn't understand because the rhythm of the story was so compelling and so enjoyable that I could say to myself, even if I didn't say it outwardly, I knew I could go back and, and find out what that was, but it wasn't getting in, in the way of the story. Uh, and of course, the great thing that you hope is going to happen, you revise, you revise, you revise, you revise, and you finally get it where you want it, and you look at it and you say, 
gee, that's great. It looks like it was just written for the first time <laughs> because the reverse can happen very easily. <laughs> you, can, you can muddy it up and drive it into the ground. So it's a very dangerous thing. You have to be very careful with it. But Norton, I remember reading somewhere that the, the editor, I don't know if it was Jason or, or Jason was, was, yeah. was the editor, um, was because editors are always screaming about digressive material, that you're not oh, on yes. the story, and that he didn't like the, the Chroma's orchestra. Yes, the, oh, I've, that was a very difficult thing for me because uh, Jason was a marvelous editor, and I, one of the best things he did was he never got you there and said, do this, do this, do this. He'd bring up a question and you'd discuss it, and it was, right. you know, and you knew how he really believed it, and, and he, that was one of the things. He felt that the, the, the whole section on the, on the orchestra that played the, the, uh, the colors of the day, the dawn, uh, it didn't really advance the narrative of the story, and I knew that, but I just liked it. <laughs> and so finally, I, I, was, I stood my ground, and he said to me, in, very, in a very calm and measured voice, he said, well, it's your book. <laughs> it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> this is one of the premier editors in, in America. Pu American publishing. And, <laughs> and you expected him to... I don't know what I expected, but I, I didn't expect it to suddenly have to say, okay, I, I put up and I can't shut up now. I got... <laughs> Well, it's, for me, always, it's a good example of where you want to lose the thread of the narrative because it's so much about, it's not on narrative, but it is on the theme. It's not on the story, but it's on the theme of, of Milo's education, of the things, yeah. all the things Milo hasn't uh, yeah. known. Well, part of, the, of a story like that is that, that pieces of it, or sometimes large pieces of it, are not, as you say, part of the narrative. They're just a small sense of either discovery or a way of looking at something that gives you pause. And you gather yourself and you go on. And they don't, it doesn't, everything doesn't have, it's not like a murder mystery. <laughs> it's, it's like the White Knight's um, uh, story, the White Knight's song in Alice. It's not really on the story, but it's so on the right. theme of Alice. No, I, I agree with that. And if Norton had a kind of didactic narrative where one thing led to another and that proved this point and that proved that thing to prove another point, another point, another point, it wouldn't be the Phantom Toll Booth. It would be a very boring, uh, <laughs> teach him something that's useful. Uh, Chilmer's book, which nobody would be reading anymore, and I probably would never have known how to illustrate in the first place. It'd be a ca one more casualty of the Cold War, right. Um, gentleman here, please. Yeah, hi, my name is Jamie. Um, actually, this question comes from my dad. And he says... No, excuse me, your dad is messaging you yeah, right yeah, now? Yeah, He's yeah, texting yeah, exactly. Me. He, he couldn't be here. Um, but he says, and this is for both of you, actually all three of you, um, do you believe in our country, in the state that our country is in right now, is, is it in the doldrums? And if so, how do we get people to realize to get out of the doldrums? And, uh, and how do we do it? Oh boy. <laughs> Are we? Yeah. Uh, can I text him back? Sure, go away. Uh. <laughs> oh, there we are. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh. um. Tell, tell, tell them we'll get back to them. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we'll get back. We'll get back to them. I think that it's true. May I slide this? Oh, no, I'm not doing it. See, I'm a Canadian. We're not very good at throwing things. Only if we have a stick do we do, we, do, we do well. Um, uh, next, uh, next gentleman here. I was wondering about translations of the book. <coughs> Ooh, good question. You talked about your, your friend who read it when she was young in, yeah. in Russia. Did she read it in Russian? And, yeah. and with all the wordplay, have, have there been difficulties in translating it into other languages? I've never been able to get an answer to the fact, because it's always puzzled me. I, th I would think that wordplay is very difficult to, to transpose. One but thing is sure, it wasn't by Constant Garnett that you translated it. <laughs> right. But it's, been, it's, ha it's now <coughs> over 30 different languages that it's in, Every, you know, all the ones you'd expect. And then we have a Catalan edition, and we just, there's now one coming out this fall in Romanian and uh, all over the world. And uh, I, I don't know with most of them, because I don't know anybody who's read it. I know the Russian edition, uh, was, uh, Maria, the woman I know, said it was very, very good. I can't read it and verify that, but, so I don't know. You, you have to ask yourself, that, don't you? How do they translate short shrift? For instance, in, <laughs> into Russian, it's, it's so much else. Well, those are things that I wonder about. Yeah, exactly. Right? I got the funniest one was I was home one day and this enormous package arrived. 
and it was galleys for the Japanese edition. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and they, I laid them out on the table, and there was a little note that said, please check these through and see if, <laughs> see if everything is okay. And, and uh, you, of course, we all realize that Russians have great experience with short shrift. So. <laughs> That's right. true. That's true, too. I think we have time for one last question, and we have one last questioner. What could be more fit? Um, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your architecture career and what okay. kind of building well, you'd like to design. I, uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania Architectural School, which is a pretty good school. And after I finished, I had my Fulbright, and then I went into the Navy. That was the time in the early... You 19- did? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was the time when you had to go in. It was uni- universal military training. And I very reluctantly did so. I, I had the option of enlisting as an enlisted man in Europe for 21 months or staying in for a year longer and... Um, into an, into an area in the Navy engineers where I, might, I thought I might learn more about what I was ultimately thinking of doing, being an architect and building things. So I chose the Navy, I went in, and it was uh, very different than anything I expected because I met people and uh, uh, confronted uh, events and situations that I never would have done if my, if my life had gone on the track I thought it was going on. So in that way, it was very valuable. Uh, I came out, I worked the, the usual thing, or I worked for a number of different architectural offices and then started my own practice with a friend. And uh, I, en- I enjoyed it, you know, immensely. I, I like, architecture is one of those things where you deal with a lot of people and it's a very collaborative kind of thing and where you have to, um, in working with them, uh, sort of dampen a little bit your own ego and try to find a solution in the team for the problems you know that you have and that's a very valuable lesson also we did an awful lot of different kinds of buildings the, the great advantage I had is I had left New York City at the time in New York City if you're an architect or have an architectural firm if you do one or two projects that are similar you suddenly are an expert in that particular thing and that's the only kind of job you will ever get again uh, and we're working up, up in the in the, in the rural areas, you get a much more variety to do things, and I loved it. And we did a lot of did a lot of schoolwork. We did a lot of uh, 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 buildings for for theater and art. Uh, we did a, we did fire stations. We did all kinds of things. We worked for several years for Colonial Williamsburg, designing buildings, you know, down there. Not for the historical ones, but for things like the. Uh, the uh, we, we like we did one building to house all of their uh, artworks and, and everyone had a different requirement for how they, how they had to be stored and, and taken care of. So that was, it was just very, you know, just incredibly testing of you and we enjoyed it. We did a, we did a number of projects for uh, people who had handicaps, things like that. But every, everything would turn up new and I loved it. And uh, as I said before, and, and all of that work, that approach to how you do those problems I, I becomes part of the way you think, and that part gets applied in almost anything else you do, and has certainly in my own writing. Um, I'm being told that, as the psychoanalyst used to stay, say, we have to stop now. <laughs> um, we're, we're out of time. Can I just um, say that, first of all, just an incredible uh, thrill for me and for The New Yorker to have both of you here with us today, and mm-hmm. thank you again. We could come back and talk. Uh, I'd love to talk to Jules sometime about uh, your plays and your writings, Norton, about the all the, the other books that you've done, and uh, all of them interesting in the way. But if I may take a, uh, an MC's um, a license to say that this book, The Phantom Tollbooth, is not just an American classic, but it is one of the, the richest books. Because as I said in the essay I wrote, it seems to me more than any American book I know, it makes a case for the love of learning for its own sake mm-hmm. and for how central that is to living a full life. So thank you for thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you.